Well, ladies and gentlemen, the passage we're up to today is Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Uh, I'm going to read that from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, you'll see that in the service on your screen or if you've printed it off, or you can follow along in your own Bibles at home. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of the Messiah, to which you are also called in one body, control your hearts. Be thankful. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to spend a few minutes uh, thinking about that passage, and you'll see uh, an outline there under the passage that I've just read in your service sheets. Uh, there's a comments box down the bottom of the page. Uh, please use that comments box to send us any questions, any feedback, uh, even any pastoral needs uh, for which you might need prayer. What does a mob of Christians look like? Well, Paul's dealing with how God's people, Christians, in this case in a town called Colossae in modern-day Turkey, should live. Uh, last week in verses 1 to 11, he dealt with what they should not be like. Uh, this week in verses 12 to 17, he deals with what they should be like. In both cases, Paul's command and argument can be summarised in this short phrase, live as you are. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that you've preserved this letter from Paul and Timothy written under your inspiration uh, to the Christians in Colossae. I thank you that they make clear in chapter 1 that their ministry is to God's people everywhere, in every place, in every time. And so thank you that we can read this letter and have it applied to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Father, please help us to live as we are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline, and I want to begin with two very important words, the most important of which is actually often not even translated. I look at verse 12 with me. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Uh, Paul could just as easily have started this verse with, therefore, put on. Uh, that would have been a clear statement of what he expects, what God expects in terms of the behaviour of God's people. A clear expression of the moral standard that God's people are to be held to. But that's not how he starts the verse, is it? He's placed a very important explanatory statement at the beginning of verse 12. Literally, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on. And the key word is as. Little words are really easy to miss in God's word, aren't they? And we skim over them looking for those big, rich theological terms. But it's often the little words that help us see the connections and see the theology that's in the passage. As is a crucial word because it turns what would have read as a clear list of moral guidelines, good deeds, it turns that into an expression of an identity that God's people already have. I find it frustrating that so many translations leave out that little word, as. A Paul's point is very clear. Being a Christian is not about good deeds. It's not about being moral enough for God's, God's approval. It's not about doing enough to earn God's approval. Being a Christian is not about what you do. It's about who you are. A Christian is someone who accepts Jesus as the Lord of the universe. 
and Lord and Saviour of them. Now, behind that statement, there are a whole lot of other truths that are worth unpacking. A Christian knows that they're naturally the enemy of God because of their sinful nature. A Christian knows that on their own they live under the rule of the devil and not God. A Christian is someone who knows that nothing they do earns God's approval or the removal of his judgment of their sin. A Christian is someone who's come to realize that left to their own devices, they're an enemy of God, unacceptable to him, opposed to everything he stands for. No amount of good deeds, good behavior, moral history is going to change such a person, change their heart so that they're acceptable to God, reach his standard of perfection. But because Jesus has beaten death for them, because Jesus has lived the life they could never live and died the death they deserved and risen from the dead for them, because Jesus has satisfied God's judgment of them, because they trust that in doing this, in being raised from the dead, Jesus has been declared of the whole Lord of the whole universe, because they've been joined to Jesus by taking him at his word and living like it, by having faith in him, because they've been so connected to Jesus that his story is now their story, then they are acceptable to God. They're holy. They've experienced the love of God. They're loved. And they know that it is because of God's initiative, God's decision, that this is all possible. They are chosen. And then they express their identity in their behaviour. Their behaviour expresses a reality that already exists in and of them by God's kindness. Their behaviour doesn't create their identity. They live as they are, which leads to that second word after as, therefore. Because these people, Christians, have an identity that turns on Jesus being boss, on being Lord of the universe, on being united to him, then their behaviour changes. The image that Paul used last week was the image of changing clothes. The external behaviour changes to show the reality of what Jesus as Lord has already achieved in them. As we saw last week, it's even deeper than just a change of clothes or external appearances, isn't it? It's the putting off of the old man, the old way of life as people connected to Adam and his rejection of God. If Jesus is their Lord, then they must put off that way of behaving because they've been changed in who they are. And the language of changing clothes was used there in verses 8 and 9 to pick that up. But then they must also put on, mustn't they? Put on a certain type of behaviour because they've been reclothed, put on the new man, the man of Jesus who is everything that they couldn't be. And so they display this new identity in their behaviour. Well, last week in Colossians 3, 1 to 11, uh, there was a focus on the vices, two lists of five vices, things to put off. Well, this week there's a focus on five virtues, things to put on. Look again there at verse 12. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. None of those attributes, none of those virtues should surprise us, should they? They're all really taken together, a description of the nature, character of Jesus, who is our Lord. Put simply, if you are the new humanity, if you put on the new man, then you reflect the new man, the bloke who kicked it all off, Jesus Christ. And all these attributes are community focused. It's very hard to display them if you live on a desert island or in a vacuum. But in case anyone's wondering what they might look like in practical day-to-day community existence, and you've got to remember that all the personal pronouns here are you, plural, in case anyone's wondering what this looks like, Paul and Timothy then explain it practically in two phrases that are really rather confronting. Look there in verse 13. Accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Now, that's pretty confronting. On the one hand, God's people are exhorted to bear with each other. The community of God's people is not a flat community where everyone is uniformly the same. 
Uh, we come into this community with all the hills and the valleys of our own personalities, our own histories, our own foibles, our own idiosyncratic natures. And in this community, we're to bear with each other in those valleys and hills that come with who we are as individuals. On the other hand, even more than that, we are to be forgiving of each other. Did you notice that this forgiveness doesn't come with strings attached? Nor does it come with exceptions? Did you see that it covers the complaints we might have against each other? Did you see that there's no prerequisites for how the forgiveness is given, that you only give it if someone's apologised first or they've earned the forgiveness? Now, God's mob are told that their nature as God's people is seen in how they forgive each other, that they forgive each other. In case we missed it, Paul and Timothy then tell us again what this forgiveness looks like. Look there in verse 13. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. That's even more confronting, isn't it? Just as the Lord has forgiven you. What a reason. That was forgiveness achieved and offered when we were dead in our sins, when we were actively God's enemies. That's forgiveness achieved and offered not because we approached God first, not because we apologised first, not because we deserved it. That was forgiveness achieved and offered by the costly death of the one true Son of God for the people who hated him. That's forgiveness achieved and offered at the very moment we deserved God's true and righteous and eternal condemnation. That's forgiveness achieved and offered that covers all of our sin, removes all of our sin as far as east is from the west, as Psalm 103 reminds us. And that is the reason, that is the model for the forgiveness that displays the nature of the new man in God's community. In winter, when I go running, I layer up. I usually wear three or four layers. And the final layer, the outside layer, kind of like this vest, the layer that holds it all together so that I'm warm and toasty, is my windstopper vest. It tops off all the other layers, ties them all together so they can do their job properly. And the final layer, the layer that binds all of these attributes together, enables them to do their job, is there in verse 14. Above all, put on love. The perfect bond of unity. It's really hard to adequately describe or even understand what that verse means. It's so magnificent. It seems that on one level, love is the great perfecter, the great unifier, the great binder upper. It ties all of these attributes together and through them produces unity. Without love, these attributes and actions are empty. On another level, love seems to be the ultimate attribute, the engine for all the others so that they can actually exist to produce unity. And the love that's being described here has already been experienced by God's community, hasn't it? Did you see it back there in verse 12? God's chosen ones, holy and loved. Did you see its practicality there at the end of verse 13, just as the Lord has forgiven you? If you need to understand what this binding together love looks like, this windstopper vest of love looks like, how it binds and perfects and unites and drives, well, just look at the forgiveness that is declared in Jesus that you have experienced. Well, Paul and Timothy have exhorted God's mob to put off, so now they exhort them to put on, to be dressed appropriately in a certain way of behaving and living because they've got the new man on them, the new humanity of Jesus Christ. It's a set of virtues that are displayed in bearing with each other and forgiving just as Jesus forgave us, a statement of love that we too are to display. So let me ask you three simple questions as a way of starting to burrow down in applying this. First, have you yourself experience the complete forgiveness achieved and offered by the sacrificial love of Jesus. Second, if you have, 
Do you display that same bearing with each other and forgiveness in the community of God's people without keeping a grudge, without demanding acceptable behaviour or an apology first, without expecting any response that affirms how lovely you are, without speaking maliciously or in rumours? Are we, as a community of God's people, well known for our forgiveness and love, a forgiveness and love that reflects the very nature of the bloke that we follow who is our Lord? In the early 2000s, I'm at point three on the outline, the Sydney Swans finally started to get their act together in the AFL and started to win and to win well. And they developed a reputation at that point for being one of the leading AFL organisations in the country. There have been many articles written about that change and development, that movement in what they were doing on the field, but all of the articles seem to come back to something that happened off the field, a, a change in culture within the heart of the club and the engines at the heart of that cultural shift. Uh, the Sydney Swans developed a culture that was connected to their past history, which constantly questioned what they were doing, which created accountability to each other, which was embodied by the idea of the bloods connecting who they were in the past with who they are in the present. And the cultural change was at the heart of this football change and it was continually examined and affirmed. Well, God's people have been transferred. God's people have been transformed. God's people have been exhorted to put off and put on. Well, what's at the heart of the culture that they live? Well, culture can be simply defined as the way we do things around here. Let me say that again. Culture is simply defined as the way we do things around here. We can be more complicated than that if we want to. It can be more multifaceted and we can debate it, but that's a working and workable definition. So now that we've seen what God's mob look like, what's their culture? And what's, it, what's it the engine, the engine room of that culture? Well, it's there in verses 15 and 16. And let the peace of the Messiah to which you are also called in one body control your hearts. Be thankful that the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now, two parallel commands, they mirror each other. They display a change from verses 12 to 14. Verses 12 to 14 were second person plural, you as a community here. In verses 15 and 16, it's third person singular, let this be amongst you. The two commands mirror each other in their structure. Each has a let, each describes something of the Messiah and each unpacks what that looks like. As we look at both of these commands, it's so very important to notice who is described as being at the centre of these two commands, the centre of the culture of God's people. It's Jesus, isn't it? The Messiah, the one promised by God who would come to roll back sin and return God's approval in this world. He's the Lord of this community because he's the Lord of the universe. His actions created this community. His kingdom defines this community. His kingdom is the postcode of this community. It's no mistake then that he's at the heart of the culture of this community. One part of that culture in verse 15 is the peace of the Messiah. A peace in this sense is not kind of like you find on the North, on the Korean Peninsula, the absence of hostilities, a Cold War. It's not just coexistence in the same geographical space. Peace here is referring more deeply to the restoration of the fullness of God's design for things. It's the restoration that comes from sin being dealt with and the fullness of God's design being restored as it should be. That can only happen when Jesus deals with our sin. Remember Colossians 2 verses 9 to 10? Peace here is life as God designed it in all its goodness. It's to rule in the hearts of God's people. It's non-negotiable. It creates a heartfelt and deep-seated thanks. This is life as it should be. And it comes only because... This bloke called Jesus has dealt with the thief of peace, which is sin. 
The other part of the culture, <coughs> excuse me, is the message about the Messiah. Did you see it there in verse 16? This is the proclamation of Jesus' identity and where he stands in the plan of God to deal with our sin through him. This is to dwell richly amongst God's people, not in some forgotten way or kind of superficial way, but deeply and richly and abundantly, kind of like the root language of Colossians 2, 6 and 7. This is to be the means by which God's people teach and admonish one another, encouraging each other to walk with Jesus as boss, to live as you are. This is to be the heart of how we sing, which is a means of teaching and admonishing each other with the message about the Messiah. This is to be the source of great gratitude in our hearts as we consistently and continually come face to face with what God has done in Jesus. Now, as a way of spurring us to think about our culture and the engines of our culture, let me ask you three simple questions. Is this our culture? a culture within this community of God's people that's centred on Jesus, the peace he achieves for us, the return to the fullness of God's design and the word which proclaims him? Or is our culture defined and driven by other more deficient engines? Is the peace of the Messiah expressed as a deep-seated satisfaction in an understanding of the sufficiency of God's full design for his creation, restored in the lordship of Jesus? Or do we rail against God's design, complain about God's design, dodge God's design, seek to bypass God's design? Is the word of the Messiah dwelling richly amongst us as we meet together in our households and as a community on the front lawn, as we gather to do ministry together, as we catch up for coffee, as we meet one-on-one? -on -one? Or do these become social occasions, distracted ministries, catch-ups that meander for no good reason? Let me share with you one of my mother's classic lines as she greeted people. Have you been reading your Bible and praying? What a question. It's a question worth asking, isn't it, as we meet each other, as we live as God's community. So how do Paul and Timothy sum all this up, sum this section up which focuses on God's community living as they are? I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 17. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, if the other statements were confronting this statement is all-encompassing, isn't it? Is there any part of your existence as the community of God's people which that phrase doesn't cover? The ambassador of Australia to America is Arthur Sinodinus. His job is to represent Australia in the USA. At every moment, at every point, in every part of his life, both public and private, Arthur Sinodinus must ask himself, how does this reflect on Australia, its reputation and its interests? I think that's what Paul and Timothy have in mind as they command, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. After all, they've already commanded us to walk with him as Lord. They've already pointed out that we've been transferred and transformed. They've already shown us that this means putting off and putting on. Now they state what this clearly means. All of our lives reflect on our Lord. And so as we do anything, as we do everything, as we say anything, as we say everything, as we think anything, as we think everything, as we do anything, as we do everything, our baseline question is this. How does this reflect on Jesus? Moreover, they give us an attribute that has run as a thread through everything they've said so far giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's only possible because, as we heard in Colossians 1, 21 to 22, we've now been reconciled to God. But it also reflects the very truth that our whole lives lie under the lordship of Jesus and Jesus as Lord is enough in all of these things. We're dependent upon him and he provides all that his people need by being their Lord. In this then is the baseline constant 
the underlying constant of the clothing and the culture that we've just looked at, the baseline constant in the community life of God's people, all they do is to be considered as a reflection on Jesus. And in all they do, they are persistently thankful because their Lord provides all they need. In fact, Jesus as Lord is enough. So here we come, the full circle. Here's the answer to our opening question. Do you remember what it was? What does a mob of Christians look like? Now, I'm not going to give you some flashy collective noun. A mob of Christians is known for its bearing with each other and forgiveness, just as they were forgiven by Jesus. A mob of Christians has a culture of peace and a culture of the word of the Messiah, where they delight in the restoration of the fullness of God's design and are richly indwelt by God's word. A mob of Christians constantly reflects on how everything displays Jesus as Lord, thankful always. A mob of Christians lives as they are. Is that us? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing us into the community of the Lordship of Jesus. Thank you for transferring us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the Son you love. Thank you for transforming us in this, clothing us in Jesus, so uniting us to him that his story is now our story. Father, help us to live as we are, as a community that is known for displaying the very thing that formed us, the forgiveness we received in Jesus, as a community that displays the peace of the Messiah and the word of the Messiah, as a community that does all of its things, all of its activities to reflect on the lordship of Jesus, <coughs> as a community that is always thankful. Father, help us to live as we are. Amen.